Hello and welcome everybody to my talk on the universality of small-scale structures in dark matter. First of all, a big thanks to the organizers of this wonderful conference that they gave me the opportunity to present my and my co-workers' work. My name is Sarah Konrad, I'm a postdoc at ITP and the Excellence Cluster Structures at Heidelberg University and I'm working on analytical approaches to cosmic structure formation in the framework of kinetic field theory. The work that I present to you today is mainly done together with Jonadav Barry Ginat from Technion in Haifa, Matthias Bartelmann from Heidelberg University and members of the Bartelmann group. The work I present today can also be found on archive on these following links. So let's get started. We want to know how do cosmic structures grow. Here on the left you see a picture of the temperature fluctuations of the cosmic microwave background and on the right you see a picture of the two mass redshift survey showing our galactic neighborhood. And the question that we want to answer is how to get from the left where we can derive the cosmic density perturbation fluctuations to the right. So the picture that I'm working in is the picture of kinetic field theory. And the approach works as follows. We're considering basically particles in classical phase space. So our mathematical object is the full six n-dimensional phase space coordinate x that collects all the particle positions q and all the particle momenta p. Furthermore, we need some initial conditions that were encoded in a probability distribution. The last two ingredients are particle interactions and the expansion of space-time. Here on this axis is Q, the particle positions, here are the particle momenta. We start with some initial probability distribution, evolve that in time, get a final probability distribution, and this time evolution is governed by the Hamiltonian equations of motion. So particle interactions and the expansion of space-time, those are encoded in a Hamiltonian H. So the Hamiltonian in the cosmological context is given by these two terms. We have a kinetic term, p squared over 2m, and we have a potential term. Now note that since the space-time is expanding, our mass m will be time-dependent. Now the flow from initial to a final state is governed by the solution of Hamilton's equations of motion in the expanding background. Now, since we don't know the full solution to the n-body problem, we need to apply some tricks. And the first trick that we apply is that we split our Hamiltonian in a free and an interacting part, such that due to the linearity of the equations of motion, also our solution is split into a free motion, for which we can know the solution and a contribution from the interactions for which we not necessarily know the solution. Now, the question is, what are smart splits? A smart split is given by the Zeldovich ansatz. So we go from our full Hamiltonian, split it up to get a split in the particle trajectories. And the first thing to do is that we choose the linear growth factor d plus as a time coordinate and we choose now the free Hamiltonian such that the particle trajectories are simply given by ballistic trajectories. With this, we find that the full particle trajectories are given by the Zeldovich trajectories minus a term that is governed by a potential which is itself sourced by the difference of the density contrast and the linear density contrast. Now note that this ansatz is exact, so no approximation has been made here in this split, that these expressions for the trajectories are fully exact. And by this potential we see that Zeldovich already takes gravitational interactions from large-scale structure into account. Now let's come to the Zeldovich power spectrum. This will be our first object of investigation. The Zeldovich power spectrum in KFT looks very similar or basically the same as in LPT. So we have an oscillating integral, we have an exponential damping prefactor, and here we integrate over initial particle positions. Here 
in the exponent is the initial moment-momentum correlation matrix, which can be written in terms of these two functions, a2 of q and a1 of q. And due to the continuity equation that has to hold initially, these two functions are given in terms of the initial density perturbation power spectra integrated together with some Bessel functions. Now, in order to investigate a more diverse set of dark matter models, we introduce a small scale smoothing such that the initial power spectrum can be written as an amplitude times k to the ns, which is the spectral index. Then we have the transfer function of called dark matter squared, and we have a smoothing kernel that can describe various temperatures of dark matter. Without this smoothing, we have cold dark matter, and for successively smaller k values that are cut off, we get hotter and hotter dark matter. Furthermore, we see that we have these sigma squared terms, which are the momenta of the initial power spectrum. And by introducing a smooth thing that is exponential, we can ensure that all these momenta exist. Now, let's have a closer look how the Zelovich power spectrum looks like. So, as k goes to zero, so for large scales, we find that the Zelovich power spectrum is exactly equal to the linear power spectrum, as expected. Now, what's happening at large k, so small scales? At small scales, we could show that the asymptotics of the Zeldovich power spectrum attains a k to the minus 3 asymptotics. More precisely, we derived the whole asymptotic series and also computed all these coefficients and found that the asymptotics is given by 1 over k plus a 1 over k to the 5 term plus 1 over k to the 7 and so on. So odd exponents in k. And the reason for this asymptotic series is that this integral here has a settle point at q equals 0, which means that we need to expand these functions a2 of q and a1 of q around 0. And we get a series in even powers of q. And when we insert the first orders of these a1 and a2 function into this integral, we see that the sigma 1 squared third term that's appearing in the a1 of q cancels precisely this exponential damping prefactor. And we are left with the Gaussian integral. So here with the q squared term, this one we can integrate analytically and we end up with the k to the minus 3 asymptotics. Now note that this k to the minus 3 is really completely independent of your choice of your initial power spectrum as long as in the sigma 2 squared exists. So every power spectrum, regardless how steep it initially is, will attain a k to the minus 3 asymptotics in the Zeldovich approximation. Now let's have a look at the time evolution of the amplitude. So this is the expression of the amplitude of the k to the minus 3 part. You see that it first steeply rises due to this exponential term and then it falls off like time to the minus 3. Now what is really fascinating about this time evolution is that it attains a universal maximum at approximately 54.78. And this maximum, again, is completely independent on the choice of your initial power spectrum. What, however, is dependent on the choice of your initial power spectrum, so on your cutoff, is the time evolution of this amplitude. So the time at which this maximum is achieved depends on sigma 2 squared. Now recall that sigma 2 squared is one of the moments of your initial density perturbation power spectrum. And the colder your dark matter is, the larger this value will be. So for large values of sigma 2 squared, this maximum is attained really quick. So cold dark matter has a much faster time evolution at small scales than hot dark matter. Now, the next question that we wanted to answer is what happens to the small scale structures if we don't impose an initial UV cutoff?
So we consider initial power spectra that drop off like a power law and probably also some logarithms. And what we did previously was to compute the asymptotics of the Siltovich power spectrum was to expand the functions a1 and a2 of q for small values of q. This was basically done by Taylor expanding the spherical Bessel functions and with this was no problem because our initial power spectrum was exponentially cut off such that all the coefficients exist. Now, this does not work anymore. When we now Taylor expand the spherical Bessel functions with a power law tailed initial power spectrum, the integrals would diverge. So how can we deal with these divergences? So there is a technique that's called uh, Mellin transform technique, where you rewrite these integrals in terms of Mellin transforms. You then have to search for poles in the analytical continuation of the Mellin transforms of the initial power spectrum and the spherical Bessel functions, compute the residua, and by that you get asymptotic expansions of A1 of Q and A2 of Q, and you got rid of the divergencies. So applying this Mellin transform techniques leads to these double sums. So the asymptotics is now given by a sum that contains even powers in Q and a sum that contains fractional powers in Q. So when we look at a cosmological reasonable case, then we know that the initial power spectrum typically falls off like k to the ns minus 4 and potentially some log terms. Now, when we apply the Mellin transform technique, the first terms of a1 of q and a2 of q now looks like this. We have sigma 1 squared third, so a constant. We have a quadratic term, and then we have a term that goes like q to the 3 minus ns. And since ns is approximately equal to 1, we get another term here that is also approximately quadratic in q. And as you can see now here in the figures, where in purple you have the function a2 of q and a1 of q without the constant prefactor, you see that the asymptotics of the q squared part and the q to the 3 minus an s part basically approximately cancel. And if you take the sum of them, then you resemble your functions. So we really need this q to the 3 minus an s term to correctly describe the small scale behavior of these functions. OK, now we can return to our Zeldovich power spectrum with the asymptotics of these two functions. We plug the asymptotics of these two functions into the integral. And by that, we get a series for the Zeldovich power spectrum without imposing a UV cutoff that is valid for cold dark matter. You see that it again goes like 1 over k to the 3. And then we have an infinite sum of terms that goes like k to the 1 minus ns times integers. And again, since ns is approximately equal to 1, this is a very tiny number. So you add up successive terms that are very similar to k to the minus 3. Here in purple, you see the dimensionless cold dark matter Zeldovich power spectrum. You see that we need to add up a lot of terms in order to get a match of the asymptotics and the spectrum itself. The k to the minus 3 part is very much underestimating the actual spectrum, and we need at least 500 terms in order to get the actual spectrum at about k equals 1000 over megaparsec correct. But nevertheless, we would expect that at some very high value of k, you would get the k to go to the k to the minus 3 asymptotics. Now, what we saw is that in the Zeldovich approximation, power spectra always attain a k to the minus 3 asymptotics. The question now is, does this k to the minus 3 asymptotics remain when we include more interactions beyond the Zeldovich approximation? For that, we need the nonlinear power spectrum. Now, what we use is a mean field ansatz, where we basically don't apply the full 
interaction operator to the generating functional, but we calculate an average interaction term. Now this average interaction term will then be scale dependent because we average over correlated particles. And now the most interesting question is does the K2-3 asymptotics remain? And yes, it will. So we computed this term, we analyzed the asymptotics of this interaction term and we found that for K going to infinity it becomes constant. So if we have our Zeldovich power spectrum, multiply something that is constant for k to infinity, and Zeldovich has k to the minus 3 asymptotics, the k to the minus 3 asymptotics will remain. And here you see our result. In orange you see the analytic nonlinear power spectrum from mean field in kinetic field theory compared to a numerical power spectrum. And as you can see, they are very close to each other and the relative deviation is less than 10% up to wave numbers of k equal to 10. Now, what to take home from today? Kinetic field theory can be used without extensive assumptions to investigate the universality of cosmic structures. I've demonstrated that with the Zeldovich power spectrum that goes like k to the minus 3. I've shown you that in kinetic field theory we can incorporate interactions that go beyond the Zeldovich approximation via a mean field approach and we still remain at a k to the minus 3 power spectrum. And these results, these asymptotics, are universal and independent of the shape of your initial power spectrum. The exponent of minus 3 is a pure consequence of the number of spatial of dimensions. The time evolution, however, of the small scale structures, this one seems to be sensitive to the initial power spectrum in the cutoff, so the temperature of dark matter. Now, this opens new possibilities to investigate the formation of small structures in dark matter compared to baryons, depending on the stream crossing timescale in dark matter compared to the cooling timescale of baryons. And with that, I thank my collaborators Matthias Battelmann and Jonadav Barry Ginat and the Battelmann Group and my funding. And I'm looking forward to meet you in the discussion session.